or is Department of Mathematics, Physics, and Computer Studies. Yeah. Really interesting. So uh, it is sounds like Department of Natural Science. Well, yeah, and it's it's because of how small we are, too. <laughs> there are three math professors, one physics professor, and one computer studies professor. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, uh, I think that it is time to start our uh, session today, and our first uh, speaker is Charles. I'm really happy that you are with us, uh, even uh, you are busy because of a lot of duties. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, the floor is yours. Please. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out for the first talk of this uh, day of this uh, workshop, and thank you again to Elena for the invitation and to the other organizers. Um, so my talk today will be on uh, group presentations um, on the Coxeter groups of type A, B, and D, and we're going to use prefix reversals or otherwise known as pancake flips, right, as the generators. Um, this was dual work that I did with Sal Blanco, uh, who's at Indiana University, and I also included little images of our, <laughs> our uh, school emblems on the, in the bottom here. So... Um, just to give the background, right, uh, the pancake problem is sort of the inspiration or at least the starting point. So in the December 19, 1975 edition of the monthly, uh, Jacob Goodman, who was writing under the pseudonym Harry Dwader, like a, a hurried waiter, introduced the pancake problem where a waiter used only a, a spatula to sort pancakes from largest to smallest and a pancake flip or prefix reversal we'll call RI, reverses the order of the top I pancakes in a stack of N pancakes. And the question was to find the minimum number of flips needed in the worst case, which he denoted by F of N. Um, and that still is an open problem, still not fully solved, right? Um, and if you saw Saul's talk yesterday, uh, he introduced some of the values that are known. Um, <clears throat> but I, I don't claim that we're going to solve this problem today, but, uh, but at least, it's an inspiration of using those particular uh, permutations. Uh, a variant that was, as far as I know, first introduced by Gates and Papa Demetrio uh, in their paper where they produce significant uh, bounds on uh, the original pancake problem is the, uh, the so-called burnt pancake problem. So the stack should be sorted with the, making sure that the burnt sides are hidden. Right, so every time you flip over a pancake, you reveal the burnt side, and then when you flip it back, right, you put it down. So there's an extra constraint of worrying about making sure you've uh, returned the orientation, right? And in this case, G of N is used for the worst case, like tracking that burnt pancake number. And I'll include these illustrations, right, uh, because I made these in 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 text so that I could uh, visualize it, right? So this is flipping over the top three pancakes. And the figure is um, <clears throat> better uh, sort of um, summarized using a permutation, right? Since they're all different diameters, we can rank them based on which is the largest and smallest diameter. And the intent of the pancake problem, right, is to sort it into the identity permutation, one, two, three, up to N. <clears throat> and in this case, right, we just flipped over the top two or top three. So reversing the, the prefix, reversing the first so many elements of that permutation. I tried to make a burnt version that has a little darker at the bottom, <laughs> bottom to them in the coloration. Um, so then this would be the burnt version. Um, instead of writing a negative sign though, to indicate that the burnt side is up, uh, I used an overline, but it's also common practice to do an underline as well too. And um, since we, those cover, Coxeter groups of type A, right, which is synonymous with the symmetric group, and type B, which is synonymous with the hyperoctahedral group or the um, or the the sine permutations. But uh, one other thing is uh, type D um, hadn't been actually studied before, and because we were in the neighborhood of Coxeter uh, Coxeter groups already, and since it's it's a particular subset or subgroup of of type B, we thought we might as well describe a type D variation of burnt pancake flipping, uh, which I guess I've called even burnt pancake flipping, but I'm not settled on that name. But uh, what's true about type D is that you have to require that only an even number 
of your uh, elements of the permutation have a negative at any time. So in this case, I couldn't have flipped over the top three. That would have been disallowed within this type D or even burnt pancake version. But, uh, <clears throat> but I could flip over the top four and then have a negation of four of these elements, right? Negative six, negative four, negative one, and negative two. So it's, it's, it's a constrained variation on the burnt pancake problem. And how long does it take to sort there? Uh, or at least introducing that problem, but maybe not coming to any uh, immediate results yet, but we could actually, I guess, test some uh, computer running of small pancake numbers for this, this variation. But okay, so uh, to sort of give some background, right, uh, and and so that we're all speaking the same language, or at least I'm, or I'm speaking a, a common a, a common framework. I want to describe what is a presentation of a group, and then move on to the standard presentations of the Coxer group uh, type A, B, and D, and a little bit about their their graphs, of course, because this is this being an algebraic graph theory uh, workshop, and. Um, then talk about the very when we switch over to using prefix reversals or pancake flips, and then a little at the end, right as you can see in the outline, about uh, a little more on what we plan to do or hope to do, if possible, with uh, some more word processing techniques. So, um, <clears throat> so okay, given a set of generators and then a set of relators on those generators, which would be effectively words that are equivalent to I words in the generators that are equivalent to the identity element. Um, so then you have elements that are in this, uh, well, with the generators or their inverses, then the symbol, right, the angle brackets around S and R, right, is a presentation of the group if the group is isomorphic to the free group on these generators modded out by the, the set, uh, right, the, the group the subgroup generated by the relators, right? Where FS is the real group and relators are what are equivalent to the identity. So there's a subtleness of language, right? Relators would be things, a word itself that should be equal to the identity, but uh, a relation would be where you have two words that are equal to each other, which any relation, you could move the elements over to the other side of the equality and get a relator and vice versa, right? And uh, consistently throughout, I'll use the letter E for the identity element in this group. So yeah, here I summarize, yeah. Relator would be A, B, C inverse, right? Just a particular word in the generators, but that could be rewritten as a quote unquote relation. So here are some standard examples, just to, <laughs> to note that there are some known presentations, right? For example, the cyclic group, of order n, which I denote by z mod n, right, would be uh, with one single generator, call it x, and uh, the relator, the relation or the relator would be x to the n, right? <clears throat> that if you raise that generator to the nth power, right, you come back to the identity. Uh, the Vergruppe or the Vergruppen, right, uh, or the Klein four group is, is presented this way with two generators, a and b, both of which, when you square them, you get the identity. So they are involutions, but it's also commutative, right? So that's the very last relation. relation. Uh, the dihedral groups, another, here's another classic uh, <clears throat> uh, presentation, right? You have the two generators, one, one of sort of primitive rotation, right? And F being a, one of the reflections. And you have the order of, of R being N, the reflection being two, and then saying that you combine two to make a, a single reflection again. <clears throat> uh, even the icosahedral rotational group, so I included this one because I found that particular presentation, has three generators and uh, these particular relations. Uh, the quaternions, right, Hamilton's quaternions have two generators, I and J, or at least this is a presentation. That's something to, to be clear about, though, is not these aren't the unique presentations, but a particular presentation for a decided upon set of generators. And that's going to be the, the, the what we're intending to do in our, in our results, right, is prescribe the set of prefix reversals 
and then find what are the a sufficient uh, set of relations that make the this this uh, free group modded out by the relations into a group that's isomorphic to the intended one, the the type A group, right? The symmetric group, the oct hyperoctahedral group, and then the subset, uh, the type D groups. And finally, right, another classic generator set uh, and and set of relations is the symmetric group on on N. And these uh, set of generators, right, S1 through Sn minus one, are uh, considered as the pre uh, adjacent transpositions, right? Flipping two elements that are side by side in the permutation. Um, and this sort of served as an inspiration, right? I, that that was the work I did in um, in grad school was mostly on on uh, the symmetric group and the Hecke algebra, right? A, a, a generalization or um, a a, uh, <clears throat> a a yeah a generalization of the group algebra on the symmetric group. But uh, nonetheless, that was why I. I when when I first learned about prefix reversals and the pancake problem, right, it it sounded vaguely familiar, right? You have these these particular elements that can that are of order two, right? If you flip and then flip right back, it, you return back to the original permutation. And um, I wondered if there were sort of similar relationships there with the uh, with the prefix reversals. So uh, one of the major tools that we use to create these presentations or, or, to, or to discover them are what are known as Teats transformations. So I'm gonna give a description of these Teats transformations, which, uh, which I got from a book by Magnus, uh, which tells you a way to rewrite a presentation into, well, to, to retain what group you're, 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 you're presented but, but to change what the, the generators may be and the relations accordingly. So to, to generate equivalent presentations, so to speak. So what are the rewriting rules or transformations that can be done to this presentation that retain the, the, the group structure? So if you have a word S that is derivable from all the other relations or, or relators, then you may add in that particular word as a relator, right? So as long as it's equivalent, it doesn't change the, the isomorphism class of this, of this presentation. The second Teats transformation is if you have a relator S that is derivable from other relators that are already there, then you can safely remove it, right? So this is the sort of inverse transformation of the very first Teats transformation. So that doesn't change what, what group this is presenting. If you have a word K in the generators, A, B, C, and so on, then the generator X can be added. And then you can additionally add, so X being uh, e equal to one of these words, right? That word that is uh, that can be expressed in the generator. So you can, in the existing generator. So a way to add in a new generator without changing the group is to also append in this relation. And sort of the inverse of that as well is if you have a relation where a particular generator is equal to uh, a word in the other generators, so V is a word excluding P, then the generator P and the relation may be removed with any P in the relators to also be replaced by the that word V from that relation that that would um, yeah so you could you could replace out P so to exclude it from other relations or relators that are already present <clears throat> so it's fairly intuitive transformations on a pre presentation and we're going to utilize these to well that that was actually the essence of the proof we utilize these. Uh, to take a, the presentation that we proposed for the symmetric group in terms of generate of these prefix reversals, and then sort of use them step by step to actually reveal that oh, this is the same as the presentation for the symmetric group with adjacent transpositions, and similarly for type B and type D. But to give you an example of using Teats trans transformations, right? 
Uh, let's look at a small example because the, the the actual proofs for a for each of our presentations are fairly long and wouldn't be sufficient for uh, the, the time constraints, right? And it wouldn't be as interesting, maybe more interesting in a read, I hope, right? But uh, but less interesting in a talk setting like this. So say we have this group presentation, A, B, and C are the generators, and we have this single relation that A, B squared, uh, so A, B times A, B it, times A, and then just B squared is equal to the identity. So can we so disentangle this presentation to make it into some familiar presentation, right? Possibly. So we could use the uh, third teach transformation and introduce two new generators, uh, call them X and Y, and we're replacing AB and uh, AB squared. Well, at least that's the intent, right? We're, we're representing them by these two new generators. Well, by the first teeth transformation, I can append in uh, just rewriting the very first relation uh, with my new symbols for AB and AB squared. So that's just rewriting the AB, that very first relation with X's and Y's. So since we've rewritten it, right, it is derivable from these three new relations, then we may remove that first original relation and we still haven't changed what group this, this presentation would be isomorphic to. And we could continue this process, right? Like uh, now we could rewrite um, <clears throat> B in terms of X's and Y's and A in terms of X's and Y's and append those on because they, they are derivable from the two relations um, X and Y, these two right here. <clears throat> and then um, we can remove the generators A and B by uh, replacing, because we can describe A and B in terms of the new, the two new generators that we created, right? Then we can expunge them from the list and rewrite any existing relations in terms of these X's and Y's. So we, we saw we can rewrite A, B as X, Y inverse X and B by X inverse Y. And similarly, A, B squared can be rewritten in this way. And if we do that rewrite, we may remove the generators A and B and also those relations that sort of define them in terms of X's and Y's. Well, um, after some simplification, right, you can see that uh, if you simplify this first relation, you get something trivial that X equals X. So that's not necessary to include anymore. So we can remove it by the second teach transformation. And if you uh, work this out, it simplifies down to being Y equals Y. So that also can be removed from our set of relations. So now we're down to just a single relation again, but uh, two new generators. And finally, you can rewrite uh, y and in terms of x's, right? Y, if x squared y equals the identity, then of course y equals the inverse of x squared. Um, <clears throat> so we added a new one that's derivable from the last. And well, that means we can derive the x squared y from this relation, so we can remove that. And uh, because y is expressible in terms of x, we could uh, actually remove that those that pair of the generator and this one that defines it. And we see that initially the group that we were generating is precisely the free group on two elements. Okay. So that's maybe a, an outline of how we actually produce these proofs of the these presentations that I will show you later on for the Coxeter groups using a new set of generators. So we were always constantly making sure that in the end, the set of generators that were left would only be the prefix. Well, actually we started with the prefix reversals and then ended with those adjacent transpositions. So a lot of the work was trying to see the interplay between prefix reversals and adjacent transpositions as permutations. Okay, so now let me uh, 
you know, the background of what are these coxeter groups? What are their defining uh, generators and relations? So um, first to just define what is a coxeter group, if, if you're unfamiliar. <clears throat> uh, so a set S, um, given a set S of generators, right? Then looking at a, a function from ordered pairs of S to uh, the set from one to an infin including infinity as a possibility uh, where it should be symmetric in the elements, right? Um, <clears throat> and that if you, if you have the element in itself, right, the, this generator in itself, you'll get one, but that's the only time when you get one, then, um, <clears throat> then the group generated by S and these relations where you're saying that you're taking these two generators raised to the M, uh, M S sigma power, right, is a Coxeter group. So in other words, you can define a Coxeter group only by looking at what are the orders of pairs of the elements. And thus, yeah, those are the only relations that are necessary to sufficiently describe that particular uh, symmetry group. And I use W as, as, as its tradition, right? Uh, that, that's alluding to vial groups, right? Um, so yes, M, S, sigma, right? These, these values are the orders of the pairs of generators. So these values can be recorded in a matrix, which is called a Coxeter matrix. And um, by definition, right, that first sort of precondition on these M, sub S, uh, M of S sigmas, right, was that it has to be a symmetric uh, uh, matrix with the diagonal of one. So here's an example of what could be a Coxeter matrix. Actually, this is a, a sort of um, particularly chosen example because these turns out, these are the orders of pairs of prefix reversals. <clears throat> um, so also associated with this, or at least a way to summarize these values that are in the Coxeter matrix instead is to use what's called a Coxeter diagram. So that's a, a graph, right? Uh, that has nodes that are the generators and you label edges that are between two generators if these values are greater than or equal to three. So if they're two, don't connect them at all, right? It, it, don't connect those two particular nodes, but if it's three or more, connect them. If it's three, you usually don't write the label at the, so that's my edge at the bottom here. But if it's greater than three, then you'll label those edges with, the, with whatever that value is. So that's a way to sort of condense these Coxeter matrices. So our initial work on this was to try and see if like, because of this analogy between the adjacent transpositions and prefix reversals, our, our first hope was maybe this is just a different Coxeter gener a different uh, sort of Coxeter presentation for the groups if you use prefix reversals or pancake flips. <clears throat> so, but to, to point out, well, what is the, the Coxeter type A? So that would be what is uh, summarized by this diagram. So in other words, since S1 and S3 and Sn minus two and Sn minus one are not connected in this diagram, we know their entries would be, would be two in the Coxeter matrix. The corresponding entries like the one N minus one or N minus two entry, but S1, S2, since it's connected without a label, would have a three on it. So that's summarized here, these relations here. And SI, SJ is squared, right, for whenever we have um, two adjacent transpositions that are far enough apart, right? So S1, what does it do? It switches what's in position one and position two. Uh, SI would sp swap what's in position I and I plus one. So these are a sufficient list of, of relations that would create a group that is isomorphic to the symmetric group on N elements. And uh, since this is an algebraic gra graph theory talk, I thought I should include a graph. Here is the graph of the, the Cayley graph, right, of uh, the symmetric group generated by these, um, these uh, adjacent transpositions, these S of I's. Um, it, you might know or might be familiar with this particular graph, right? It's isomorphic to the permutahedron. 
Right, that is true. And actually, you know, this graph has name bubble sort graph. The bubble sort graph as well. Yes, absolutely. So I thought it'd be fun to include this as well too. Well, what is also nice, or what I think is is particularly interesting, going back to these relations, right? If you look, so okay, the fact that SI squared is the identity, right? Uh, that means that it's safe to write this as a undirected Cayley graph, right? Because they are their own involutions or own inverses, the generators themselves. Also, right, so when the, the subscripts are within one of each other, you, you can cube and get the identity. So where is that borne out? Well, uh, you can see that's these uh, hexagonal facets or faces of this graph. Right, these order six cycles are are presented by those relations, right? And the other relation is that if they're far enough apart, you'll get the four cycle. So that's these uh, where you see these these uh, square faces on this bubble sword graph. Similarly, or very uh, the next sort of non-trivial case is what uh, are known as the type B Coxeter groups. So those have an additional generator, right? So they have N generators when you're in um, degree N type B. And the very first generator is connected to S1 uh, by a, an edge of, of, of weight four, let's say. So these are the defining relations for the Coxeter groups of type B. And this is isomorphic to the uh, hyper octahedral group, as it's uh, as it's known, okay. um, or these are signed permutations. So these S one, S two, up to S n minus one are the same. So you you can consider them the same way. They are adjacent transpositions and not changing signs. But then there's this added S zero that changes the sign of the very first element. So you can describe any signed permutation by sort of putting it the one you want to negate up front then negating it with that zero and then putting it back in place. So we have the same relations of all of them are their own involutions as, as is defined by that uh, property of the Coxeter matrix. Um, this particular relation, so that would be a four cycle or, or an, oh, sorry, eight cycle, right? Because these are two elements, right? And you rotate around four times. We have our six cycles again and the, the four cycles. So here is a, a image of the sort of signed permutahedron, so to speak. Uh, and here is the eight cycles. Unfortunately, I didn't label all of these. I, I didn't want to worry too much about uh, overwhelming it with, um, with too much information. But yes, these, these octagonal faces, those are, are correspond to this, this S0, S1 to the fourth relation. Uh, the square faces, once again, are about those transpositions that are far enough apart. And these hexagonal ones are about the, the braid relations, they're sometimes called, right, where we have um, adjacent transpositions that are close, right, within one of their subscripts. And then finally, right, since it was, it's, it's not hard to describe, and it's a particular subset, of type B, I want to expose the, the type D as well. And why isn't there a type C? Well, I think there, there initially was a type C, but it turned out to be isomorphic to this type D as well too. So I think the type D sort of held on. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so what are the defining relations? Well, there's an additional, once again, uh, generator. This time we'll call it S0 prime, and it's connected off of S2. And what's the difference is this S0 prime, it, it negates the first two elements and flips them. Okay. And that's why it interacts strangely with S2, which swaps the first two elements. So of course, they're all their own inverses. Um, S0 prime and S2, when you combine them right over and over again, you get a, a six cycle. And then of course, we have the same six cycles how S0 prime and SI interact is the same as with other, uh, other ones of the generators, except for, of course, S sub two, right? But, uh, but yeah, you get these four cycles as well, too. I, I don't know uh, as much about drawing polytopes. I, I kind of used 
some existing work to draw this signed permutahedron. Um, but I do wonder what does this Cayley graph look like? And especially if it's embedded in, in space, right? Like what, how that would appear. I, I wonder if it would have those same facets, uh, but I've yet to actually see someone do that work yet, maybe in the interim, right? But I didn't have the time before uh, this presentation. But yeah, <clears throat> so sort of the impetus of what what started my work on this uh, and, and later when, when with, uh, presenting some of the initial um, results with Saul was trying to think about working with these generators of the, the these prefix reversals as a word in, and, and using word processing techniques, which I realize, of course, that the word problem in general is not solvable, right? That's been that's been known for quite a while, right? Uh, since the mid 20th century, but uh, I still, that's true in general, but there can be special cases where uh, the, the group is quote unquote automatic or, and, and, and the word problem is prob probably solvable. So I was curious if that is possibly the case with, uh, with prefix reversals as the generators. So, that rephrases the pancake problem as finding uh, the, the longest reduced word within um, this setting. So just to point out some word processing, and we'll come back to this as well too, but a word in the generators can be reduced using these relations. And when we find the what is a uh, re completely reduced or the least number of generators needed in the word, that is the length of the word. So for example, the permutation 24153 can be per, can be written as this collection of uh, adjacent transpositions. Um, also a note about how I multiply tr transpositions. I think of them as, as, um, as uh, functions, right? So I'm thinking of S1 happens first on this far right, followed by S3, followed by S4, followed by S2 and so on. But we can apply these relations within here on this word. So for example, S4, S3, S4, by the braid relation, that can be switched to S3, S4, S3. That's that, um, that six cycle. So the other side of the, the three uh, permutation, the other three generators. And that brings into can, adjacent to each other in this, in this word, S3 and S3, which we know are their own inverses. So that can be nullified. Then you can continue on rewriting, like finding um, possible rewriting. So S1, S4, they are more than one apart, so they can commute as generators. And then I put into line pairs of fours and pairs of S1s so that those can be canceled as well. Once they're canceled, then we get to S3s that are, are together and they can be canceled and we can reduce this down until we can no longer apply any new relations that shorten the length of this uh, this particular word. Thus, the length of two four one five three as a word in these adjacent transpositions is four. Um, and right, another part of this inspiration of trying to do it this way was known results about adjacent transpositions um, from Coxeter groups on if type A. Right, if you know the the permutation, right, you can count the number of inversions. So I wondered if there was possibly a permutation uh, statistic that we could use to find uh, the lengths in, pan in pancake words, so to speak. Unfortunately, there isn't, uh, or at least there isn't a clear one. And uh, it's highly unlikely that there would be since it's been proven that the pancake problem in general, like taking a particular permutation and finding what are its pancake generators, that's an NP hard problem. So, but uh, but I was hoping for a longest reduced word uh, sort of way of finding the diameter of this of this uh, Cayley graph, right? Which would have been solving the the, the so-called pancake problem. <coughs> okay, so now considering using prefix reversals as the generators instead. So, where what am I going to use for the prefix reversals? R I will represent reversing the first I elements of your permutation. So written as a, as a, as a window of a permutation, right? Uh, or in one line notation, 
right? That's what it would look like. Or if you write it as we will very well know, right? You can write every permutation as a, as a product of um, disjoint cycles. And in the disjoint cycle version, right? We can see like, oh, one in I gets switched to an I minus one. And I use the floor and ceiling because sometimes they, they could collapse on each other. Depends on whether I is even or odd. But that reveals something, of course, about the RIs that they have to be, um, <clears throat> that they must be involutions themselves, right? Must be their own inverses. And they can be rewritten then in terms of adjacent transpositions. So these two cycles can be written as products of adjacent transpositions fairly nicely, that there's a sort of way to translate from prefix reversals to these S sub I's. So this was key in our rewriting uh, uh, the, the group presentation in terms of RIs. <clears throat> Another key result was also recognizing that adjacent transpositions can be rewritten in terms of these prefix reversals. Basically, if you want to switch what's in position I and I plus one, first you bring I and I plus one up front by doing a reversal of I plus one, swap those two with R2, and then put it back in place. So our the first hope was maybe these, these would generate a Coxeter matrix that, that, that would be a sufficient set of relations on these prefix reversals um, and trying to find the patterns that were there first and then looking at what they were actually, uh, what, what was the consequence or which group was generated by only including these orders of these relations on pairs of elements. So for the small Coxeter matrix, it wasn't very clear what the pattern was in general, but then for a larger matrix, you can actually reveal some of these patterns, which I've colored, right? So you see bunches of fours once they're far enough apart, right? And then a sequence of four, six, eight, 10, down these diagonals of six, 12, and 20, six and 12. Those are pronic numbers, right? Products of adjacent integers, or uh, uh, not adjacent, uh, sequential integers. Um, and then of course, right, the three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and the ones along the diagonal. So there is, we one of our first works that uh, Saul and I did was uh, these some relations on prefix reversals, where we were summarizing all these, uh, these patterns that we found in what would have been the Coxeter matrices of these, if, if they were a sufficient list. But um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, and, and strangely enough, or, or maybe coincidentally, right, uh, uh, Elena and, and Alexander Med Medvedev uh, did a similar work, right, that they published in 2016, right, where it was maybe differently motivated, but it, we, we reframed it in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of trying to make a Coxeter matrix for these. So, right, just summarizing what all of these are and, and yeah, we get these interesting results about uh, the orders of adjacent elements in fairly, well, somewhat complicated um, descriptions. But unfortunately, these weren't sufficient, these just including only those, and we tested sometimes in a uh, gap, right, uh, the groups, um, algorithms and permutations, I think, right? But we use the computer algebra system to check whether these uh, relations and those generators were sufficient. Like what, what was the order of the group that was generated by them? Most of the time, if you only included just these, these orders of these relations with only the pairs, you would just get an, uh, an infinite group. And that's kind of borne out by that uh, Coxeter diagram. Anytime you get a Coxeter diagram that creates a cycle, you're, you're going to end up with, a, uh, with an infinite group. What would be the Coxeter diagram for these would actually be the complete group or, or the complete uh, graph on n minus one vertices uh, with all kinds of all these different labels on them because several of them are greater than three. And there was just no hope of possibly generating a finite symmetric group. <laughs> Sorry. But um, we didn't. We didn't give up, right? Uh, we thought, okay, so we need to take a different tack. Just having the orders of pairs of elements is insufficient. So we needed to find another way to define these relations. 
So that was where we studied more of what was existing right, uh, um, in group presentations and found teach transformations as a way to rewrite from one presentation to the next. And using those sort of uh, translation identities about prefix reversals and adjacent transpositions, we came to this sufficient finite list of relations that actually does generate a or, or present a group that is isomorphic to the symmetric group. So still some are important, right, uh, and, and familiar, right, the, the, the pairs of elements to certain powers certainly are important within here. But then we gain these seemingly strange and, and complicated other relations that were necessary in order to get the translation done and to make sure that these were finite. And we really were checking these um, for very small values of small values of n, we were checking that oh we were actually generating the group in question. <clears throat> but then really running through all the teach transformations and showing these uh, ways of rewriting each other, right? That they were derivable from each other was was the key to to the proof that this is a sufficient list of relations on the prefix reversals. Now. That, that at least sort of completed scratching an itch of wanting to know what is it, all the relations, right? But but our, our sort of continuing question like uh, is, well, what does this afford us, right? Could this could this be used to do some sort of rewriting um, in terms of words to reduce down words in prefix reversals or in pancake generators? <clears throat> and uh, these are, I, I would at least presume, based on the analogy with those uh, uh, Jason transposition Cayley graphs, that these might be somewhat interesting and important cycles within the Cayley graphs, within the pancake graphs, right? That, that well, maybe when we realize it in space, right? These would be the important facets, similar to what's happening with the bubble sort graph and the, uh, the sine permutahedron. <clears throat> so I, I thought maybe let's look at a small example for S4. I can draw that um, pancake graph. So sub looking at the, the relations that are only occurring for when N equals four, right? We get this pair of relations. So that's that uh, that's going to be a six cycle, right? And then an eight cycle. And then these, uh, let's see what, how many, how many generators are here, right? That would be a, a seven cycle, right? Or it might be, no, that's another eight cycle. I'm counting wrong because because it's early here, uh, seven cycle there. And let's see, that's four and seven and a nine cycle. So we can kind of see these within here. So like, of course, the first relation is telling us that we don't need a directed graph for this Cayley graph, uh, which is well known. Uh, R2, R3 cubed. So R2, R3 cubed, that's this hexagonal cycle. That's the, the, the smaller copy of, of the uh, order three pancake graph embedded within this within this graph, and so are these other six cycles here. <coughs> the R two R four. Well, if we follow the trail of R two R four, R four R two, right? R four and then R two. We sort of traverse within this graph. R two R four. So that'll bring us here. And then, um, <clears throat> so I'm only going to things that in, involve R2s and R4s. But this this relation is going to be it actually this particular permutation would be the same one, although it can be rewritten in terms of an R3. And you you traverse this path within there. Unfortunately, I didn't highlight each of the corresponding paths of these, but that might be worthwhile and interesting to look at. Maybe in in trying to figure out how the pancake graph is embedded in a particular space. Like I do not, I don't think it is explicitly known that uh, wh whether these are planar or require genus one or genus two, I'm not certain. I think there are existing bounds of the genuses for uh, pancake graphs, but I don't know if it's explicitly known for particular values of N. And possibly our, our rewriting <clears throat> since uh, writing it as a as a um, as a presentation, right, is similar to what's done in topology, right? When looking at fundamental groups, maybe this presentation that we've 
we've created may be applicable to finding the genuses of these particular uh, graphs. Um, another sort of key result that was within there was a couple other sort of translations between the, the, the adjacent transpositions and um, these pa pancake reversals. And I thought they were worthwhile to, to share with you, right? These were, these were other than those first two that I showed you before, how to rewrite R, uh, Ri in terms of S sub, uh, S sub Is or S sub Js and rewriting S sub Js in terms of Ris, right? Um, we have these other key relations about uh, three of these reversals and their, uh, <clears throat> their analogous uh, adjacent transpositions. So we take, we flip K plus or, or K of these, bring it over there, flip the first three, and then put it back. What's that akin to a braid within the adjacent transpositions? <clears throat> and another interesting result we found was like, when i is less than j, then these are actually in, um, commutative, right? We can commute these um, reversals and adjacent transpositions, um, but not uh, not exactly commuting them when uh, when you have a smaller adjacent transposition in between there that would be affected within the reversal. But there's some sort of not exactly anti-symmetric, but somewhat anti-symmetric nature to it. Um, I'm being mindful of time. I'm, maybe I added too much into this. But, but in the type B version, um, we have these negated uh, reversals, right? R, I, R, they change the sign as well to, to track that those have been switched. And that includes then negating these S zeros, right? Each time you put that uh, first element there that needs to be negated up front, you need to negate it with an S zero. So that's why those are included here, but there's a nice pattern within the, the adjacent transpositions. <clears throat> and we realized that, yeah, there's another re reversal, right? Where you reverse first the, the first element. And similarly, you can rewrite these unsigned ad adjacent transpositions in terms of these prefix reversals. And this was new work that we had done in that same paper on the sum relations of, uh, on, on the symmetric group and hyperoctahedral group, where we looked at the type B, which uh, we, no one had, had completed already, right? We, we got there before Elena did this time. <laughs> and then uh, to follow up, right, that still didn't, weren't a sufficient set of, of generators for creating the, uh, 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 presenting the hyperoctahedral group. So we performed the same process with the, with the teats transformations in order to uh, present the type B hyperoctahedral group. And a small case is when N equals three, right? At least that's, that's not too unwieldy of a size, right? When N equals three, we get a, a, a group of order 48 and these are the, the defining relations. Although we stated it's for n greater than three, that's because uh, um, this fourth relation uh, only is, is pertinent for four and above. <clears throat> and find also this, uh, this eighth set of relations is only pertinent for four and above. But um, if you do deal with n equals three, you can just basically ignore these particular relations and still get a, a a set of relations that that are are sufficient for the uh, the group B sub three, <clears throat> and here's the um, the pancake graph. But uh, I didn't relate. I left them as the sign permutation versions. Um, but uh, I did highlight these cycles. So this one is is the very first um, <clears throat> uh, twelve cycle. The R two R three cycle can be found here. Then the next cycle is this outer ring cycle, but that's that's the uh, that's that subset, right? The that embeddable, that's that hierarchical structure, right? That these eight cycles are the copies of BP two that it, are embedded within. So that's sort of intrinsic and important um, to point out in the relations. Then we have this other <clears throat> this other cycle um, that comes from the next set of relations. Another cycle that's sort of intertw intertwining some of these subcopies, and this 
other cycle, these other through few cycles that um, overlap. So my my inclination is maybe these are the facets or faces. If we if we drew the this um, burnt pancake graph in, um, in embedded in some space, that might be an explanation of why these are important as the relations. But I, I, I wonder if, if someone else could tell me, right, if there's another good interpretation of what these relations might be. <clears throat> um, another key lemma, right, was about this uh, translating between. And actually, we get this uh, particularly nice six cycle <clears throat> that's always equal to the identity. And that was helpful in translating between. And, and once again, even with signed permutations, even with burnt pancakes, Right, we still have these sort of uh, commuting relationships between the adjacent transpositions and <clears throat> the prefix reversals. So since it was sort of low hanging fruit and was right there and we hadn't seen anybody look at the type D of, of prefix reversals before, we thought we might as well. So in this case, you keep the relation uh, or use the generator where it's not signed, but uh, but instead include just signs that change the first two to, to sort of stay in common with um, what's going on with, uh, with the Coxter relations. <clears throat> so all we needed was a lemma, the lemmas that were already established in type A in order to um, describe the, the presentation of type D groups in terms of these prefix reversals. It's a little more extensive list because you need some more of the uh, uh, relations on this this signed to flip, right? And then, of course, you need the relations from type A about how they intermingle the R twos up to R ends, <clears throat> and and you need how do they uh, interact together? So, were the ten classes of of different types of relations that were necessary? Um, so now, uh, where do we hope to go from here? Is a uh, so the initial thought was, okay, can, can we get at least a presentation and then maybe use these word processing techniques to sort of reduce down these words? So what's a way to sort of automatically set up such a word processing was to, to create what's known as a rewriting system. So if you have a presentation and an ordering on the words of the generators, and generally well, one ordering that's almost always used is, is short lexicographical order, um, so you're trying to shorten the word and keep them in, in lexicographical order or uh, in matching with Elena's uh, canonical uh, um, descriptions of pancake cycles might be to, to re in reverse lex order though too, either, either way. But as long as you have some sort of ordering for these, for these words, then you can consider these relations as being what are called reductions, that you're rewriting a word into a either shorter or at least lex or reverse lex order that's preferable. And a re rewriting system is called confluent or sometimes referred to as complete if you can ensure that if two words can be, well, if a, if a single word can be reduced down to two distinct words, P1 and P2, then it's confluent as long as there is a, another word, a fourth word that both P1 and P2 can be reduced down to as well. So if we have a, a sort of one single stream breaking into two, then it's confluent as long as those two can be brought back together into one again. <clears throat> and then a rewriting system is known as terminating as long as there's a finite set of reductions that is sufficient. <clears throat> so we wanted to hope, the hope is possibly using these relations, we can create a confluent and terminating rewriting system that could be applied to reducing words in these prefix reversals. A process that can be used for that is what's known as the knuth bendix algorithm. Um, so what, what it basically does is, is takes your existing set of reductions and then just keeps adding reductions for where there are overlaps. So you look for, well, where could there be a missing confluence? You try to force that confluence to occur. And I think I I'm, I'm, might be too short on running you through an, an example of Knuth Bendix, but uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately we haven't yet been able to run this in general for our our pre presentations because they're sort of um, 
I, I can do it in a computer for finite values, but it's it's rather difficult to do in general because you're trying to look at where their overlaps in these and these indices could match up, um, but but they have slightly different um, uh, descriptions. So it, it may be an ongoing project to, to attempt to do Knuth Bendix on these uh, presentations in general, or just looking at small cases, possibly even looking at like where we're at the threshold of what are known for pancake numbers and maybe uh, that, that such a rewriting for say n equals 20 or something like that might be able to, to, to make the, the computation in the computer uh, reduced enough so that it can, it can be worked out. But yeah, I went through and, and, and presented an example with a particular uh, uh, presentation, right? And tried to do a rewriting. So what you do is you look for overlaps of what are called critical pairs within your existing relation. So, so the suffix of X cubed, so the last element is X, and that matches up with the prefix of, of the X, Y cubed. So then you, over, you, you superimpose them on top of each other and then you look at reducing this with either of these two reductions, and then you get another uh, equivalence and, and try to say, well, is that a new reduction? So if you reduce this by the first reduction, you get y, x, y, x, y. And if you reduce it by the, the third reduction, you get just x squared. And since x squared is shorter, right, in short lex, then, then we use that new relation. We append on that new relation. And then you can look at other overlappings and get new relations, add them to the list. But then once those two are, uh, those two new relations, they actually um, make trivial the, the third relation that we, that third reduction initially, so you can remove it. That's part of the whole Knuth Bendix algorithm. Find reductions from overlappings and then once they make something trivial, throw it away. You don't need too many relations. You don't need an exhaustive list. Then um, you could combine the new ones with existing ones in a similar way. You get a new reduction, add that to the list. You look at the over another overlap, you get a new reduction, add that to the list, and then remove those that are now trivialized by these new reductions. So, somewhat similar to the Teeds transformations, but uh, significantly different. So then this actually becomes a complete and trivial uh, or terminating uh, rewriting system. That is, these are sufficient to actually rewriting any particular word in these generators X and Y. Okay, uh, I think I've exhausted you enough, right, as well. And thank you so much for paying attention. Well, thank you, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, any further questions to Charles? Okay, I, I just wonder, did you, did you try to do the same or something similar with generalized pancakes? What was that? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, did you try to use the similar approach uh, these uh, generalized pancakes? Oh, uh, not as of yet, no. But that would be an interesting project as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if the relations might even be somewhat nicer. There, there's been a strange occurrence, right? When you when you generalize, right, up to type B, a lot of things sort of, sort of become simpler in a way. And right. I think it's because of the constraints, right, of making sure that the orientation is right. Right. Yes. That's so right. I wonder if it's even nicer when it is yeah. generalized. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but you didn't try yet. Not yet. No. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further questions?